Welcome to Discover Ag, where every week we discover what's new in the world of agriculture. We're your hosts, Natalie Kavorik and Tara Vanderdusen, and together we bring you our professional farming opinion on a variety of trending topics in the ag and food space. All right, you guys, we're back with episode 82 of Discover Ag, brought to you by the United Soybean Board. Moving a commodity takes a strategic plan with foresight and farmer leaders like you to implement it. That's your soy checkoff. Your soy checkoff has the pulse of your marketplace and production needs. So when you pull your resources through your soy checkoff, you're making sales and breakthroughs that all come back to your bottom line. Having a sound plan delivers sound results. You can see all the ways your soy checkoff is moving soy forward for you at unitedsoybean.org. That's unitedsoybean.org. The link is in our show notes. And today we have another exciting interview. You guys loved our last interview on soil health. So we're excited to bring you another one this time with the United Soybean Board. Specifically, we're going to be chatting with Megan Kaiser. Megan is a wife and mom who farms with her husband's family in Missouri. She is not only a soil scientist at Perry Agricultural Laboratory, but also the chief operating officer and she is the current chair of the United Soybean Board. Today, we're going to be chatting all things sustainability and soil health from a soy perspective, and we're excited to dive into it. So welcome, Megan. Thank you. Excited to be on with you all. Yeah, you're going to be bringing a very unique perspective to the show today. Natalie and I are both very deep, obviously, in the livestock and cattle side of things. So I'm excited to chat with a row crop farmer and bringing that perspective. And I guess on that note, that's where I want to start is when I think about soybeans, I obviously think about cattle feed. Like that is just, that's the only place my mind goes. But when I was researching for this conversation, there is so much more to soybeans than a feed source for our cattle. So I think that's where I want you to dive in is like what all, where all can we find soybeans and like, how does it play into our food system? Yeah, we call it the miracle bean because not only are we supplying a very nutritious and I like to think delicious feed ingredient for our number one customer of animal livestock, but We found a lot of industrial uses and applications where we're replacing formaldehyde in wood products as a wood adhesive. We're utilizing soy in a lot of cases to offset fossil fuel-based products in the space in particular, like renewable diesel. We're looking now into the future of sustainable aviation fuel and making huge improvements to greenhouse gas emissions of travel and fuel utilization as a drop-in replacement for those applications. We're also using our oil for things like asphalt. Goodyear Tire did a partnership with the United Soybean Board to utilize soy oil in the tires, again, offsetting that carbon footprint that we all have when we utilize petroleum-based products by utilizing our our soy ingredient instead. And so it's one of those things where our vision is U.S. soy for as a sustainable solution for every life and every day. So not only on your plate, but throughout the day in everything you use, we're looking for new applications. We're looking at plastics and even in your tennis shoes, Skechers tennis shoes, when they have the Goodyear mark on it, they're using soy oil in the soles of their Skechers shoes. That is so neat. You dropped some very common names there that, again, we would not normally associate soy with. I know Tara and I actually talked a few episodes ago on one of our Thursday episodes about, I believe it was United that was actually leading this when you mentioned the fuel that's doing the soy. Is it an alternative or... Yeah, so it's a sustainable aviation fuel. And so it's actually going to take all types, but corn and soy both are going to be main ingredients in sustainable aviation fuel. And so that's really exciting, especially when you think about air travel. And it's been talked about over and over how big of an impact that is to greenhouse gas emissions. And really, I think of it as just an everyday consumer. Am I really going to cut back on flying? It really makes travel and connecting with people so much better. We know coming out of the pandemic of how different life was when we couldn't travel and couldn't convene. And so air travel is really here to stay, but what are ways that we could make it better? And sustainable aviation fuel is going to be a big part of that future. I have to ask you on the shoes, do you have a pair of the tennis shoes that have the soy oil in them? I do. And I not only have the tennis shoes, but they also make these great sandals that are so comfortable. Also with the Goodyear sole, mine are bright silver, but my son loves them. He has a pair that are like black and 
more boyish looking, but yeah, our whole family, we have, we, we purchase soy shoes at every possible chance we get. I feel like we're going to have to get a link from you guys on that and share it on the Discover Ag stories like that. People, we need to support that. Code Megan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah co- code Megan. <laughs> Go get your, your sandals. Yeah. We're going to see if we can get a discount. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. You totally sold it to me. I like want to go out and get a pair. They are so comfortable too. We at Commodity Classic will be on the trade show floor for hours, and it's really nice that we have a good excuse to be wearing tennis shoes rather than dress shoes. So <laughs> it's been really fun. So how, when I think about this, like I come from the dairy standpoint, and I always feel like there's like random things in the dairy that oh, milk could actually be converted into an alternative for plastic. How did soybean like really dive into this and start like kicking off this initiative? I think this is amazing. Oh, I think. If you think about it, it really started with the checkoff and oil being the byproduct from the crush that was turned into the meal. And soy has about 20% of its component as oil. So about 30 years ago, some farmers were sitting around the table and said, hey, is there a value proposition for this byproduct, which is basically oil? And it started with biodiesel. And we've gone through a lot of figuring out the chemistry (laughs) to make that into the right chemical. And so biodiesel has a slightly different chemistry makeup. And so there were some conversions and things that needed to be done and we were able to do blending and you can run B100 in in a lot of areas. It wasn't as mainstream as now we're seeing renewable diesel where we're actually able to be a drop-in replacement and it acts exactly the same in the tank of the of the vehicle. And so a lot of folks are like, well, are we competing with electric or what's that gonna look like? Frankly, from the renewable diesel standpoint, this is our way of making the entire value chain so much more sustainable. When we think about these big trucks that are moving our goods across the country or the big tankers that are moving our goods across the ocean, they require diesel fuel. And so that's a great opportunity for U.S. soy farmers to be adding our sustainability story from our farm gate all the way throughout the value chain and helping strengthen the value chain and being reliable and sustainable. You said a lot of really important things in there, but I don't know why this is what stood out to me the most. As you said, 30 years ago, we had a group of farmers sitting around and they were brainstorming and they said, hey, how can we use this byproduct? And I love that because I think it really illustrates what goes on in agriculture, which is we're really almost grassroots led in a lot of these things. Like at the core, every single rancher and farmer across the nation is really sitting down and saying, hey, how can I do what I'm doing better on my operation? How can I use this byproduct better? How can we, and I think that's missed, right? Like for people that are a little bit removed, again, going back to what Tara said at the beginning, we think of soy and I think of soy out as a crop, maybe soy as a candle, like it's very limited. And here we are as an industry really trying to utilize every aspect we can like on the animal it's nose to tail from the soybean for you guys it's like how can we use the oil how can we even distribute that in different ways and I just think it really highlights something really powerful and important about agriculture that I think gets missed a lot. I love exactly what you said it gave me goosebumps because it really is exciting how innovative farmers are and maybe we don't always get the street cred for being forward thinking (laughs) but I totally agree another example of that is Five years ago, we were in a board meeting and we were in a committee meeting and we're saying, what else can we do? We've got oil here. If we can do oils, could we do plastics? And today, five years later, we now have a straw because farmers are sitting around and saying, everybody is saying plastic straws are bad for the ocean. Could we make a soy straw? Is that something that we could build? And like, it could be biodegradable maybe. And now today we have a hyaluronic soy straw that after use, it takes about 90 days and then it'll be biodegradable. And so it's not polluting the oceans. It's a bio-based product. And so again, it's sometimes you hear people say, oh, farmers don't want to talk about sustainability or farmers that doesn't jive with and they're afraid of it. And I think soy farmers, at least, I think a lot of farmers are really leaning into, hey, We're doing some really innovative, thoughtful things that are not only good for our rural economies, good for our farms, but good for everybody's carbon footprint and social sustainability throughout the world. Oh my gosh, I feel like that was like a mic drop moment. I'm like, all right, that's it. That's our episode, you guys. (laughs) That's what we're doing. Thank you, Megan, for saying it. Give the woman a mic. She can say it a little louder. No, I think the straws are so fascinating. As a mom with little kids, nothing is worse than the paper straws. Can we just talk about that? That after five seconds, it completely disintegrates and the child is left with chewing on a 
paper straw. And I'm just like, that's so exciting that there's like opportunity to make better products that are more sustainable. I have a two-year-old and there's nothing worse than a two-year-old and a smoothie and a paper straw. It just is a disaster. And my kids actually... And even my two-year-old will be like, straw, mommy, straw, because I have to carry my soy straws with us because (laughs) you never know if you're at an airport or something and you're on the go and you have a paper straw. So I look like a crazy lady, like pulling out soy straws all the time, but I don't have to feel bad about that they can go into the trash, you biodegradable, but it certainly has lessened the amount of mess we have on the go. I'm just going to say you need to be like a soy influencer right now with your shoes, your straws, like just going around with all the products. It's a little over the top, but that it is how we are a part of every life every day. It's just a really big part of my life every day. <laughs> so I feel like up until this point, we have focused on, I don't know, I guess like soy and beyond. Maybe we can pivot the conversation and focus a little bit more on like soy and soil. I know the soybean farmers, the soybean board, you guys have really been like any industry, like in agriculture, you guys have been really working to improve land use efficiency and water use efficiency and just all of the things that go into production of our products. And so maybe we can spend, I don't know where you want to dive in. I think there's a lot of points to dive in here and we can try and cover them at all, but maybe let's start focusing on like the soil and the land and the sustainability from that aspect. It all starts with the soil. And I say that with completely biased because I'm a soil scientist and, but I can also say it as a farmer and my husband and I, we also have a precision ag company. And as soon as harvest wraps up, I'm immediately taking our maps and overlaying them with our soil tests data, our harvest data, our in-season applications and management and trying to draw out what decisions made things better. And I, or we're not alone. Every, a lot of people are doing this now. And it's really exciting because it gets us pumped up of, oh, that worked there. Do you think we could replicate it on the next field or making better data-driven decisions? And it's exciting that we can do that starting with the soil. And so we run a nutrient profile, but also that same soil sample tells us a lot about the physics in the soil. And when I look at calcium and magnesium base saturations, I can see the calcium kind of pulls the soil together and magnesium pulls it apart. And we end up with this aesthetic, if you will, change and it creates pore space. And that's so important because that's where the biology lives. And so when I look at my soil, it's not just about the nutrition that's needed to sustain the life of our soybean or our corn crop, but also the gut health of the soil, like we do in humans and as beef and dairy, you all know how important the rumen is. And soil is very similar, of cr- making sure we encourage that biological activity to build up the immune system of the soil to do a better protection of the crop. But at the same time, by building that three-legged stool of the nutrients, the chemistry, the physics, and the biology, we're creating a more sustainable land that is better productive for generations to come. And it's good for right now, and it's good for the future. So one of the things as we were preparing for this that we read about is your guys' Farmers for Soil Health Initiative. And I think you like the shortened version is FSH. So if you could talk, what is that exactly? So Farmers for Soil Health is a really big partnership with not only soy, but Corn Corn Growers Association and the Pork Board. And we're working together to encourage folks to try out cover crops in, in places that they work. One of the best comments that I heard at Commodity Classic on the stage was a farmer saying, by trying out this grant, it allows me to try things that I wanted to try, but financially was afraid of the risk. And so this grant will help people to just check it out, see if cover crops would work for you. Our goal is to reach 30 million acres of cover crops. And so it's a big grant from USDA, but the most exciting part is really in empowering farmers to try new things and helping to lessen a little bit of the financial risk. And so check out our website for more information, but Farmers for Soil Health, Ben West is the executive director there. And just, it's really an exciting program of allowing farmers to connect with people who want to maybe pay you a premium for this on farm that you might have already been doing or have wanted to try anyway, but connecting you with folks that want to tie their sustainability story directly to yours. So there's a couple, there's a couple things I want to touch on there because Tara talks about this a lot when we, when 
it's important, I think, and you brought really good awareness to this when you said maybe there's a farmer that has been a little hesitant to try something without the funding. Because when we make these sustainability initiatives on our operations, we do, Tara says it really well, but she's, you have to be making them for the future. It's a long-term gain. And in agriculture, it's hard to get that ROI immediately. Sometimes in beef, it's like we're waiting years before we see the calf and then it's sold. And so it's the same thing with farming. It's like there's this process. And so I really love highlighting the idea that there are folks out there who want to make this change or interested in the change, but sometimes, you know, that bottom line and the timeline combined, those combined together can kind of deter them. So I wanted to ask you about, so this Farmers for Soil Health, it's a part of the Climate Smart Commodities Program through USDA. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So you guys applied for that grant and you received one of those grants, which that entire program, that Climate Smart Commodities Program is amazing. It's covering so many initiatives. So that's what this initiative is a part of. Yes. Thank you for that clarification. Yes, it is. Awesome. How many years will that be running? You said your goal is 30 million. That is not a small goal. That's a hefty goal. What does your timeline look like for this? By 2030. Yeah, not very long. It's not, I was like, oh yeah, it's ambitious to say the least. And the United Soybean Board is helping to make sure we're connecting farmers in this. But the cool thing is that your checkoff is not taking anything off the top. It's it, all of this money is to be invested with farmers to be able to try these improvements. I think the other really big thing that hits me as a farmer is options and being able to manage our land in the way that makes the most sense. We make hundreds of decisions in the growing season. And I'm sure it's similar when you're raising livestock from the time that we start to prepare the soil, put the seed in the ground, the in-season management, and even at harvest and timing of everything. There are just hundreds of variables. And so I love this program for the aspect that it's helping people try new things, maybe alleviating a little bit of the risk, but it's not saying everybody has to do cover crops, that you must instill this on your farm. This is more about, let's see how this works. Let's be good scientists about it. And let's see what kind of soil health improvements we get from it. So circling back, to something you you just said it, but you also said it a few minutes ago, which is you're pushing, is it 30 million by 2030? Mm -hmm. I caught that. Okay. It sounds like the soybean industry as a whole is like getting on board with this cover crop initiative or this idea. So one of the things I want to talk about, because I feel like both in ag and outside of ag, we start looking at sustainability and regenerative as this yes, no, like this check the box you did it or you didn't. Very clean, black and white. If you didn't make the decision, shame on you. You should be making the decision to cover crops. And if you aren't, no tilling, shame. Like all these, all these things at different areas, different products, different animals. Like you said, there's variability to it and we lose sight of that. One thing I love to draw awareness around is that it is not yes or no. Like for a soybean producer in, I don't know, Illinois, it could look very different about the choice he's making for a soybean producer I don't know where would be another far area in the U.S. Missouri. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know how far (laughs) soybean spreads the states, but can you maybe talk a little bit about that, about maybe why a producer wouldn't or some of those decisions that they're making? Because I think the more awareness we go around, like it's just not yes or no. And I think people think you're either choosing yes or no, and it's not like there's a lot of variables that I think the more we bring awareness, these are some of the things they're considering and some of the reasons why they say yes or maybe say no. I think the more we have an understanding that sustainability is a spectrum and not yes or no. Yeah, I, that's an excellent point and actually a point that I'm very passionate about. So I'm glad you brought this up because, yeah, on our board, we have farmers in Mississippi to North Dakota to Colorado, to Texas. I mean, it, all the way up to New York. I'm not really saying this in the right path, but, and then we're here in Missouri, but even in, in my state, we farm next to the river. And so we were completely no-till until 2019. And we just had a devastating loss. All of our farm was under the Missouri river, all of the growing season. And guess what? We had to do some weed control and we are just now getting back to minimum till because we also have to take care of our weeds. And so It would be a shame if my entire livelihood was built on my promise of being no-till and then I just couldn't. I couldn't live up to that because of other weather influences. And so I think it's really important that we stay mindful and not judgy, but mindful of continuous improvement, that we are thinking about the ways that we can improve. And I also think there's this kind of false choice of I have to lessen my production in order to have a healthier soil or in order to instill these practices. 
I don't think we should jump to that. I think we, we need to be very mindful that we can improve the soil, but when we improve the soil, it should be a healthier soil and a more productive soil. And I don't know a lot of unhealthy people that are more productive than healthy people. And so think about that in soils, even in livestock, you don't have unhealthy cows that produce more milk than the healthy cows. It just, it doesn't make sense. So if we're making that false choice, we might have another aspect of the soil that we're missing, that we're not quite encouraging. Actually, recently, in the last, we run kind of a grid sample experiment where we go back to the same sample points and we monitor the nutrients every year on a very intensive sampling, just as an experiment. And we noticed that the year that we had cover crops put on in the first year, the nutrients were actually captured in the cover crop and they were not available for the soil tests. And so we saw actually a big reduction in nutrients in the soil test values. That doesn't mean the nutrients went somewhere else. In fact, the cover crops worked and they sequestered them, but they weren't going to be available right away for that planting. We measured it in March. And so that, that P and K were not going to be available at the beginning of that growing season. Now we're at the next year and we're ready to measure it again. And I'm excited to see how long it took for that crop, that previous cover crop to break down and then release those nutrients. But sometimes I think that we rush to, oh, cover crops caused a decline in yield, maybe because we forgot that we have to have fertility, not only for the cover crop, but also our growing crop and that they, the turnover isn't that quick. So we have to be very mindful in watching the whole system and also remember that cover crops are plants too, and they require nutrition to grow. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think sometimes with any of these like initiatives or changes, it is like the long game. There's just, you're not like, we need to be studying it for more than just one growing season. We need to see what the changes are. As you said, like the nutrients didn't necessarily go anywhere. They were in the plant, but now that needs to have time to break down and turn back into soil nutrients. And that's going to take time and being able to watch that. I love that you are like, doing I feel like you and your husband have a lot going on your farm you're doing all like all sorts of different things that sound so interesting but being able to research like the same point and going back and testing the same thing for the soil year after year so you know exactly how it's changing throughout the years yeah and it is it's a quicker turnaround than sometimes folks think that oh this is just an investment for the future I'll never see it that's not quite like planting trees where it takes years multiple years but I it is we do see in, improvements though the root structure helping to then add to the physical aspects of the soil and helping give some more pore space that then and also giving fodder to the biological activity the reason those things break down is because the biological activity in the soil breaks it down for us. And so then that helps us build organic matter and helps us hold on to more nutrients that, like nitrogen and sulfur in the soil. And so it is, there is a benefit that is, is quick to come. But as you said, nothing in agriculture is immediate gratification, but it's not, oh, this won't be here until the next generation. Your husband, Tara, mentioned that you guys are doing fun things on your guys' farm. Your husband's probably like, why did I marry a soil scientist? She has me doing all of these things. Can we not just simply farm here? I think that in the early days, he probably thought that a little bit more. But then all of a sudden, he's waking up at midnight to go put boron into the irrigation tank. And I'm like, what are you doing? He goes, it's going to hit halfway and I want it to be halfway. So when I harvest it, we can look. And so he's into it. He loves it. And in fact, it's fun because, and I think a lot of farming couples are this way. It's fun to bounce ideas off of each other and maybe tease each other when things don't go like the other one thought they were going to go. <laughs> but it makes it fun to have that continuous improvement and to be able to do it together and have our kids involved too. I love that you shared about that because I feel the same way. I, my husband and I always talk about like how much we enjoy that we both love the same thing and that we get really into it and that we're brainstorming ideas and we like bouncing ideas off each other, just like you said, and coming at it. Sometimes they are they turn into kind of arguments that you're debating it when you both have strong opinions about things. But ultimately, it like is so rewarding and helps move your operation forward that you're you have this person that you're able to grow the farm or the ranch together. Thank you for sharing like that little bit of insight into your marriage. Yeah. Thanks. I kind of want to jump around a little bit. So I'm sorry, Natalie, anything else you want to touch on on cover crops before I okay. So you mentioned in some of your notes that we got from you that you see a lot of opportunity for the waterway infrastructure with soil or with soy, sorry, around this and how we talked about the green alternatives, but really dive into kind of what that would mean for our waterways if we were able to convert more of our like petroleum based products to these soy alternatives. 
Yeah, so the work that we've been doing on from the United Soybean Board for our waterways, I'm so excited about. This is, we didn't really know how to engage because the checkoff can't own things. We can't persuade domestic policy. and But we know that the waterway system is critical, basically, to our bottom line as farmers, but also to the entire supply chain for the global marketplace. And we have the Mississippi River, which Honestly, the United States has been credited with this has been the reason we've been such an agricultural powerhouse is that we figured out how to move things by water. We've got the lock and dam system on the upper Mississippi and then the Mississippi River tributary levees on below Cairo, Illinois. In our state, we have both the lock and dam system on the northern part and then we start on the MRNT system at the Boot Hill. And so we ship a lot of things. And then, as I said, we're right along the Missouri River. We found that one of the holdups to a lot of improvements on the waterway system are environmental studies or just impact studies that people just didn't really have the funding or even know that was the holding point of why these improvements weren't being made. I think it's been five years ago. Again, a group of farmers sat around and said, oh, how can we, and I say sit around, we were being <laughs> we're chatting at breakfast and yeah, coffee. coffee. Yeah, we're at coffee. There you go. How could we do something to improve our inland waterway infrastructure? And so we worked with the Soy Transportation Coalition, and they identified that actually there's this dredging project that's been on the shelf for a while because there was nobody to do the study, the planning, and the design. And so we said, okay, what if farmers put in $2 million, which is a lot of money? Personally, our farm could never have put in $2 million to study dredging on the lower Mississippi. But it was met with a $200 million investment plus from the federal government in the state of Louisiana. And so that dredging project was just to deepen the river five feet, but it, it meant that we could load more soybeans, have a heavier ship that rode a little bit lower, and that each pass across the ocean would be that much more efficient because we had more soybeans per trip on and then that got passed back through on our basis. Since then, now we're, we've engaged on lock and dam improvement studies, and we just see things are getting going a little bit more. As a, I think all of us can appreciate that we're all citizens and rely on infrastructure, such as roadways, bridges. When a bridge is out, we all notice the bridge is there. When If it's working and in use, then we don't maybe think too much about it. But farmers rely so much on infrastructure to efficiently get our crop to the global marketplace. You know, we're loading out of the field onto a semi, then going to our elevator, which is then loaded on the rail, then loaded on the river. And then our soybeans are going on from there. It's, it plays a big role. So it was exciting for USB to be involved in that kind of infrastructure aspect. And really the most fun thing I heard is one of the higher ups at the Corps of Engineers said, it really got people's attention when farmers said, we're willing to put our money in this game, but this is that important to us that it, it got attention that farmers are making these improvements and pushing for a better future. Again, you said so many valuable things there. It's like hard to pick out where I want to dive into. But I think the two things that, again, stood out to me personally were, one, I think you did a really good job highlighting the complexity, again, of agriculture and like what goes into a, a simple everyday operation of a soybean <laughs> farmer, right? There is so much we have to consider from start to end that I don't think, I don't want to say we don't get credit for because that's not really what it's about. But I just love that the more, again, the more we have conversations around this, the more people stop thinking that like all a soybean farmer has to think about is dropping a seed into the soil and that's it it's like we you have to consider as you mentioned like infrastructure there's so many things the water like from start to end there's just so many variabilities and there's so much complexity to agriculture and the other thing that i'm really happy you pointed out tara and i will preach this till we stop but money in agriculture right like you said two million dollars some people would look at that and say maybe it is a lot or not it's a very perspective thing but the funding in agriculture one is lacking and two for us to forward as an industry it's like we have to have money i just think it's such a missed again another missed area it's like the funds going into agriculture aren't there and it's a lot of money like you said your farm would never be able to put up two million whether that's small or large compared to other investments across other industries it's like that's a lot of money and to expect farmers to do that we got to have funding yeah it really highlights what i get so excited about the checkoff is that we 
it's such a great example of farmers pooling our resources, working together, and really having an impact, a tangible impact on everything from infrastructure, bio-based products, um, soil health, and even global hunger issues. We just, all across the entire value chain, we are able to play a role because we're working together. And it really is the power of the checkoff that I'm really proud of. Megan, you um, have been... Megan, you have been such a wealth of knowledge. This has been such a conversation, a good conversation. I have learned so much. I know our listeners have too. I think the last thing I'd like to touch on, because as we've highlighted, you are a soil scientist, you are a chief operating officer, a laboratory, you're a farmer yourself, and you're also the chairboard of Soybean United Soybean Board. I want to know what is most exciting you. I feel like you have your hands in a lot of areas for the future of the soy future. Like what's exciting to you? What, where are you looking like? Where's that excitement headed towards? I am excited that it feels like agriculture is being seen in a really positive way as being a solution to problems that are every day. New York City to using biodiesel in their to reduce particulate emissions and improve greenhouse gas emissions and to being in wood adhesives that remove formaldehyde from households by being a more green alternative to just being the future of our farm, of our rural e- economy. That's good to support our local schools. That's good for, for me to be able to raise my family in our rural area. So I think I'm just excited that agriculture has such an opportunity to be seen in such a positive light, thanks to storytellers like you two. I think there's a lot of really great opportunity coming, and I think we're ready for it. And then that's exciting too. I am glad we're closing out on that. Natalie and I feel very similarly like that we feel like ag is headed in such a great direction and it feels like people are taking some notice, taking some pause and listening to what farmers have to say and hearing about how we are moving forward in a sustainable way and what that means for the future of all of us. And so with that, Natalie, anything else you want to add before we round out? No, that's it. That's all we have planned. So thanks for listening this week, you guys, to Discover Ag, where every Thursday we discover what's new in the world of agriculture. Thank you to our special guest, Megan. And thank you again to our sponsor, United Soybean Board. Your soy checkoff has the pulse of your marketplace and production needs. So when you pull your resources through your soy checkoff, you're making sales and breakthroughs that all come back to your bottom line. Having a sound plan delivers sound results. Check out more at unitedsoybean.org. Again, that's unitedsoybean.org, and the link will be in our show notes. See you guys next week.